Good morning. I'm Harley Schlanger from the LaRouche Organization with your daily update for June 18th, 2021. The first question I'm going to take up is one related to the developments of the last couple of days surrounding the June 16th summit between Presidents Biden and Putin, which took place in Geneva. And there was a somewhat surprising development, which I reported to you yesterday, which had to do with the joint statement issued by the presidents after their summit. Now, keep in mind, the buildup to the summit was one of very harsh recriminations against President Putin and Russia coming from Biden and the whole crew of, of Western transatlantic geopoliticians and war hawks accusing Russia of malign intent, of bullying, of being an aggressor, of breaking with the Western values and as part of the, the uh, rules-based order and, and so on. And this, these recriminations were very sharp and many expected that Biden would go in with a uh, head of steam having been given support from the G7 meeting which took place before the event and also from the NATO summit. So one statement that came out after the summit in the joint statement was somewhat striking. And what, what they wrote is in the U.S., uh, the, the uh, joint statement on strategic stability, it states, today we reaffirm the principle that a nuclear war cannot be won and must not be fought. And this preceded the statement of setting up a strategic stability dialogue returning the ambassadors, the Russian ambassador to the U.S. and the U.S. ambassador to Moscow, uh, also revisiting the Minsk Protocol, which the Ukraine government continues to refuse to abide by, even though it signed it. And that has been a sticking point in Russian-Ukraine relations, which was part of what was behind the uh, dangerous tension that built up in April of this year. So this statement about nuclear war, many of you have, have written to me saying, why do you at the Schiller Institute and LaRouche Organization talk about nuclear war? We'll never have a nuclear war. It's not going to happen. Well, the fact is that the discussion of nuclear war is going on, whether you like it or not, in among the ranks of the military, uh, especially in the Congress and the plans to extend huge amounts of money into upgrading the U.S. nuclear force. So the fact that this made it into the communique uh, is quite significant. Now, uh, the question on this was, I, I didn't see a potential for a positive outcome of the summit. Uh, and this is someone who is assuming that this uh, discussion of nuclear war is part of a positive outcome. And she writes, how did this happen and where does the relationship go from here? Now, let me just give you a, a brief indication. I just wrote an article on this, which will be posted on my blog page later today. But what happened is on this reaffirmation of principle, you have to look at the background to this. Uh, in March 1983, President Reagan announced his adoption of Lyndon LaRouche's Strategic Defense Initiative, the anti-missile defense system that LaRouche designed to break the world out of the existing paradigm of mutual and assured destruction, which if a nuclear war took place would guarantee the annihilation of the human race. And LaRouche's proposal is to use uh, defensive weapon systems based on new physical principles that could be shared between Russia, at the time the Soviet Union and the United States, so that neither side would use them for offensive purposes, and this would eliminate the danger of nuclear war. Ronald Reagan surprised many people by accepting this idea, and not only accepting it, but deploying Lyndon LaRouche to meet with Russian counterparts uh, representing the Reagan administration to discuss it. And LaRouche came back to the Reagan administration with a proposal from Russia where they said, it wasn't so much a proposal, it was a rejection of Reagan's proposal, saying that while we think it would work, it would give a strategic advantage to the United States and we're not prepared to do that. 
This at a point when the Russians were trying to develop overwhelming strike force capability into Western Europe under something called the Ogarkov Doctrine. But LaRouche kept at it, kept the mobilization going. We had hundreds of conferences all over the world. We had officials from the French and the German and the Italian military uh, supporting LaRouche's proposal, scientists in the United States, and also a widespread recognition in Russia of LaRouche's expertise on this, which later meant that after uh, the fall of the Soviet Union, he was invited repeatedly to come to Russia to make presentations on not only this, but the related economic impact from this. So this was an extremely important intervention by LaRouche, and it led to, the in, in uh, November of 1985, the original statement from Reagan and Gorbachev that neither side should ever fight a nuclear war, that nuclear wars cannot be won and, and should never happen. And the Biden-Putin uh, statement in the summit on uh, this week was a reaffirmation of what Reagan and Gorbachev said. Now, most people don't know this background, but it's, it's crucial to, to get one other piece of this from LaRouche, which is the statement that he issued as the LaRouche Doctrine, which I hope I can find here relatively quickly. Um, the LaRouche Doctrine, which was in March 1984, one year after Reagan's announcement, and about a year and a half before the joint statement from Reagan and Gorbachev. And what LaRouche said is the following. The political foundation for durable peace must be A, the unconditional sovereignty of each and all nation states, and B, cooperation among sovereign nation states to the effect of promoting unlimited opportunities to participate in the benefits of technological progress to the mutual benefit of each and all, which is a restatement of the principle of Westphalia, updated to include an era in which nuclear annihilation was a, a potential, but in which the benefits of cooperation uh, for all would be both real and realizable. So LaRouche's intervention was crucial and many people say that the peaceful resolution of the fall of the Soviet Union was related to the Reagan-Gorbachev statement in uh, March 1984, but also a recognition of the potential for cooperative uh, mutual development. Now, LaRouche had a proposal for that after the fall of the Soviet Union, but people who were supporting it including top bankers and industrial officials in Germany, were assassinated by so-called left-wing terrorists, terrorists, including Herrhausen, who was the head of uh, Deutsche Bank. Now, this put a damper on this, and instead what was imposed was the European Union, which immediately was uh, coherent with the NATO doctrine, of continuing a Cold War even after the collapse of communism. And so that's why today we still have a NATO, which is actually continuing to move eastward to the borders of Russia, even though the original purpose of NATO was to protect Western Europe from a Soviet invasion. So it's in this context that you look at the importance of this summit which just took place. Now, Granted, this is a very fragile statement on which to base the future relations. And to, to say that we've now escaped the danger of war would be completely misunderstanding the power of the war hawks and their control of the machinery of the military industrial complex, including the media, to continue the drive toward military confrontation between the US and Russia and the US and China. And this is what I take up in my article, which you can find at the LaRoucheOrganization.com on my blog page. But the importance of what happened can be seen in the shock effect that you see in the media in reaction to this statement. The, uh, 
the, the denial by many press that you could have any trustworthy agreement from Russia. Uh, E.J. Dion, the Washington Post scribbler, for example, said, you know, you can't trust Putin. This is there in the, especially in the London Economist, which is the magazine of the British city of London empire. They don't want a settlement. They want not only continued military confrontation between opposing blocs, which could lead to war and which they're willing to accept a war, but they're also intending to impose a top-down global central bankers dictatorship to impose a Green New Deal with two purposes. One is to create a new financial bubble, a green financial bubble to bail out the banks and the financial institutions and the shadow banking system. And the other aspect of this is to impose a Green New Deal, which would mean the extermination of half or more of the human race due to loss of electricity and power that's necessary to sustain modern economies. So the agreement expressed between the two presidents that there should not be nuclear war is important as far as it goes, but it's not definitive. What's needed is to completely break out of the paradigm which has been imposed on the world since the assassination of John F. Kennedy. But even before that, going back to the importance of the British role in subverting what FDR intended with the Atlantic Charter, instead of having it be a basis for achieving the common aims of mankind, Churchill turned it into a confrontation between East and West, a military confrontation, with the idea being that as long as you have power blocks and division in the world, the British can then manipulate the United States to use its military power, that is our military power of the United States, to defend the interests of the city of London. And that has continued, in fact, has deepened the so-called special relationship over the years to the point that it's virtually indistinguishable, whether it's Tony Blair or Cameron or Boris Johnson speaking about the special relationship in regard to the United States. And we saw that with the effort of Johnson, who previously had seemed to be a Trump supporter, dumping Trump and embracing Biden and the warlike imperial attitude that was brought to the G7 and the NATO summits. So this slight break with the meeting with Putin is important. Again, it's not definitive. It depends on what we can do and what our allies can do and what the leaders who signed this uh, Euro-Atlantic security declaration, which put forward this idea, which included U.S. and Russian military and diplomatic officials. The idea that, that this could become the basis of a real change is, is absolutely critical. And I just want to read to you the opening paragraph of this statement they put out. And that assumes I can find it quickly. Let me see. Yeah, here it is. This is the Euro-Atlantic Security Leadership Group. They said, today there is a growing risk of and a potentially catastrophic inattention to a security crisis involving an escalation or miscalculation leading to nuclear use. And what they called for in the summit, and this was June 6th they put this out, they said that to avoid this danger of nuclear war, we must reinforce the principle that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. And that explicit statement, which goes back to Reagan and Gorbachev, was incorporated into the joint presidential statement between Biden and Putin. So there is a mobilization to prevent nuclear war. This is something that's crucial for the Schiller Institute. We've been waging this battle to wake up people to understand that we're sleepwalking towards a potential nuclear war. Recognizing that is the first step to avoiding it. But then to really overcome the, the intent for this to happen, we have to break out of a paradigm defined by geopolitics, by the idea of competition, 
by the idea of who's first, who's the most uh, powerful nation, who possesses the ability to wipe people out more than the other block, and so on, and instead replace it with the principle identified by LaRouche, which goes back to the Peace of Westphalia, that nations should seek common interests to recognize that the benefit of the other benefits ourselves. So that's the significance of what happened. Again, it's not definitive. It's going to require your participation to build a movement which rejects the axioms of a Malthusian world, of a, a, a Darwinian jungle for survival of the fittest, and replace it with the idea of sovereign nations acting jointly for the common interests of all. And that's what will be the central theme of the Schiller Institute Conference coming up next weekend, not this weekend, but June 26th and 27th. Go to SchillerInstitute.com to register for that and uh, organize all your friends and neighbors and, and discussion partners to participate as well. So thanks for joining me. Have a good weekend. I'll see you again on Monday.